Well, I mean, there's always hope for reform of policies. And in fact, it goes on on a regular basis in small ways, but not just in the drug control area, but in all lots of areas of international exchange. So I think the question then is, uh, what kind of reform, who is going to be in a position to try and institute reform. Uh, part of what we're talking about uh, today is some of the ways in which some other voices might be heard, voices that are uh, not as privileged as they would like to be in the system. Uh, for example, people interested in human rights, people interested in the environment, people interested in more of a public health perspective uh, and harm reduction, what those kinds of things have to do with overall health and creating a, a control system for drugs or a regulatory system for drugs that, that has the most benefit with the least amount of detriment. So I certainly think it's possible, but I think it would likely come in smaller steps through a series of incremental changes as uh, support grows for a somewhat altered viewpoint about what the system is supposed to do and how it's supposed to operate. I have always been pessimistic about change in drug policy, both uh, domestically in the U.S. and internationally. And pessimism has turned out to be a, a perfect predictive device, as I've never been wrong. Um, having said that, there are now real influences that weren't there before. I think the Latin American frustration with the consequences of U.S. drug policy may be a significant uh, event and may force a reconsideration. I think the Global Commission on, on Drug Policy uh, is important in that respect. So there's a slight prospect for change, but not a strong one. Sure, there is hope. Uh, again, the tobacco example is, is one of, of change in a reasoned progressive direction and I think the, the movement within some nations and some states to decriminalize cannabis for example is another indication of the possibility of change. What, what you have to realize is that even though there is an international control system singular in fact, within that system, you have a variety of, of practices within particular nations and even within particular provinces or states, so that in the U.S., for example, today we in fact have a wide variety of cannabis policies operating within a single country that theoretically is within a single international system. There is some hope for reform of international drug control policies, partly because the power of the United States to impose its moral concerns on the rest of the world is declining because perhaps of the rise of large developing nations and also because of the increasing willingness, especially of the Latin American nations, to challenge the hegemony of US policy in this area. So when you see not only national non-governmental organizations but also states like Colombia, like Uruguay, like Bolivia, challenge, being, being ready to stand up and challenge the US in this national forum and say the system isn't working, we need change, um, then the, that opens up opportunities for greater discussion and perhaps change of the system. I think so. I think there's more hope today than there's been in any other time in the recent past. I think um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is the long-term failures of the system have, are becoming ever more clear, uh, not only to the public, but to politicians, and even to some people within these uh, international organizations. The goal of eradicating drugs on a global scale, which until even the 1990s was still being announced as the ultimate aim of the international drug regime, is now seen as an unrealistic goal. I was recently told by a high US official, for example, that the United States policy will no longer be directed at the eradication of drugs as a social um, problem, but as their containment, something uh, analogous to um, uh, the policies that were adopted during the Cold War towards the Soviet Union. Drugs will exist, but we will find ways in which to contain them, whether um, social means, political means, or other means. Um, the second change that's happened quite recently is that 
there's beginning to be a chorus of high-level dissent to the international drug regime. For example, in the area that I know best, which is Latin America, I'm a Latin American as my um, training, um, Latin American countries, until 10 years ago, followed United States dictates about the drug war to the letter. Their political legitimacy depended on it, um, uh, funneling of aid, military aid, and other types of aid depended on it. In the past five years, this type of hegemony or consensus around U.S. drug policy has cracked considerably. A number of countries have, uh, and we're talking about the elites within these countries, military leaders, political leaders, um, presidents, have um, dramatically broken ranks with the United States. The reasons for this are complex, um, but probably boiled down to one reason, which is that Latin American nations are being asked to bore many of the costs of the international drug war, meaning the social costs, the violence, the militarization, the human rights abuse that goes along with drug interdiction strategies or drug war type strategy. And um, many of these countries, even some which have been at the forefront of the drug war, such as Colombia, have shifted their evaluation of these costs and benefits and have decided that um, for too long they've been following everything that Washington or everything that the United Nations says and that it's time to come up with a, a more open-minded um, alternative to the international drug regime that is not necessarily a militarization of the region. Um, so these voices, for example, the Latin American Commission on President's Commission on, on, on um, Drug Reform, Drugs and Democracy, um, have actually had an enormous impact on thinking among the political uh, and cultural elites of Latin America, and I think will, um, over the next few years, actually breed some concrete changes. Yes, there is. Regimes change. All sorts of regimes change. The international um, Drug control regime is a regime, just like many other regimes, whether it's a regime to do with arms control or a regime to do with climate change and uh, greenhouse gases. Regimes change over time. Um, that doesn't mean that they naturally change um, and just organically evolve. Effort has to go into that change. But yes, change is certainly possible. I think particularly at the moment we can be quite hopeful. Um, there are certain challenges to the regime taking place in various parts of the world, specifically at this point in time, Latin America, if you look at the Bolivian um, endeavours at the moment to, to readjust their position in terms of the coca leaf, also there are statements coming out of other parts of Latin America to do with re-evaluating the international system, so you can see countries like Mexico, Colombia, talking about changes in the system. And these sorts of things would have been unheard of only a few years ago. So yes, change is possible, but it will not happen overnight. This will take quite a long time. I'm confident of that and I'm not entirely sure at the moment, I don't think anyone is, about quite how that change will play out. The present day seems to be a time when there's a lot of optimism about potential for change, but I think what needs mapping out more clearly is what the actual scenario is, um, the pathway to change. I'd like to get a clearer idea of what the factors are coming together which would bring about change. You know, in terms of reforming drug, global drug control policies, there's enormous hope, more than ever before right now. And it really comes, I think, from a number of areas. First, the Europeans pioneered reforms in the 70s, 80s, 90s, in the last decade, the Dutch and the Swiss and the Portuguese and others. And so you have now a, a sort of semi-coordinated front within the global regime coming out of Europe saying, there's a harm reduction way to deal with these things. We don't need the American or Russian or whatever style war on drugs. I think secondly, there's a change in Latin America. What you see recently with former presidents and now current presidents, first the former presidents Cardoso, Gaviria, and Zedillo from Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico, and now the current presidents of Colombia, President Santos, uh, Guatemalan, Perez Molina, uh, Uruguayan President Mujica, calling for a new approach both within their own countries, regionally, and globally. So there's the emergence of a critical mass of calling for a change in the global prohibition regime, unlike any Thing we've ever seen before. And thirdly, with respect to marijuana, cannabis, 
there really is room for there really is major reform underway. And I'm proud to say a lot of it's coming from the United States. I spent the last few decades always apologizing for my country when I speak outside our borders. But right now, this, the more leadership is being provided in the United States for legally regulating cannabis than anywhere else in the world. I mean, the Dutch led the way, the Uruguayans are doing interesting stuff now, but in the U.S., at the level of public opinion, civil society, and state government, we now have one to two million legal medical marijuana patients. We have the possibility of states voting to legally regulate marijuana. So when America, essentially the evil empire of the global drug war for so many decades, is now changing from within, I think that sends a powerful message to the rest of the world that change is in fact possible. We have to hope that there is hope. <laughs> Uh, no, I think there is hope for reform. I think we're seeing that in Latin America after many decades of uh, reluctance to challenge the U.S. on the status quo. There is no uh, challenge. Uh, I think that we are seeing a global consensus building around the fact that the systems that we have haven't worked. I think as much as that is hard to dislodge in certain quarters, we know that people are seeing that that's not true. They're seeing it in their own lives. They're seeing it in people who are affected by drugs and communities who are affected by drugs. So yes, there is hope for change. There's been a lot of change in Europe. There's been a lot of change in some parts of the world. We uh, like to point to the case of Tanzania and East Africa, which is a place where the very visible problem of heroin injection and heroin overdose has led people to think of new ways of doing things in spite of all political motivations that one would expect. So. There certainly is hope for change. It's just a matter of keeping at it, being sure that civil society and others who are informed about these things are part of discussions, being sure that people who are affected by drugs directly are part of discussions, and trying to continue to promote alternatives that make more sense evidence-wise and human rights-wise and in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think there's, there's every hope for reform in international drug policy. Uh, in two ways. One, I think there's a lot more that can be done within the, inter the strictures of the international system as it stands. Uh, there's a lot more that can be done. There's a lot that has to be done on the scale up of harm reduction services. Uh, and uh, not only is that possible in the international system, it's required, uh, if we, certainly if we look uh, at it from a human rights perspective. Um, and, you know, with so many governments now starting to push at the boundaries of the international regime, it, it, it probably has a limited shelf span, but when I say limited, uh, we could still be looking at decades of, of, of similar uh, similar approaches. Um, there are many very powerful governments that are still very stringent uh, and showing no desire to change anything. What is being created by man can always be uh, cr uh, changed by man. You know, the, you know, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Uh, and so yes, of course, uh, there's always hope that things can change. And I think we are seeing some elements of change now within uh, the status quo, uh, generally speaking, uh, a greater uh, tendency to move away from a penal-based approach to dealing with drugs use towards one that is more focused on public health. That's something that seems to be gathering momentum uh, in various parts of the world. Uh, we've seen the initiatives that have come, particularly out of Latin America, in recent years. Uh, the message being that Latin American countries are fed up with paying a very high security price uh, for a policy that they see, for a problem that they see as not uh, of their making. And I don't imagine, I don't think any of the Latin American politicians engaged in this process delude themselves that this is going to lead to rapid or radical change of the status quo, but it does represent a significant um, point of pressure. The third thing, of course, is that our understanding of science um, is progressing all the time. We, we have a much better understanding than ever we did of how addictive processes work, what the implications of them are, and that too, I think, uh, offers uh, some possibilities for change. But uh, it's very difficult to know when change comes because change often actually is not a gradual process. Uh, change often manifests itself through event horizons, paradigm shifts where 
you know, one minute you're in one state, uh, the next minute you're in a completely different state without having necessarily understood um, how, how that has, has come about. So it's very difficult to predict um, you know, whether and at what point change will occur, but certainly the possibility of change has to be there. There's, there's always hope for reform because history, if nothing else, does give us a sense of contingency, of change, and of possibility. I think it is both liberating but also um, troubling at the same time. Think about history. Because on the one hand, it's liberating. It shows us that all that has been need not be in the future. But it's, it's also cause, not for concern, but, but to take seriously the tremendous challenges that are involved in actually making that change happen. Right? So, so history tells us that change is possible, that new directions can be undertaken, and we know this, it's the, the basic stuff of, of all history, is change. But it also tells us that this change is very, very difficult. Uh, and that one meeting, uh, one publication, uh, one anything, is really just a small step in a much larger